We're in the British Museum in London, in a room that is filled with ancient Egyptian mummies. And as a result, it's also filled with modern children. <laughs> and tourists. It's a great room. There's great stuff here. We're looking at a fragment of a scroll, which is largely ignored. It's a papyrus scroll. And papyrus is a reed that grows in the Nile Delta that was made into a kind of paper-like substance and actually was probably the single most important surface for writing right up into the medieval. We're looking at a written text of something that we call the Book of the Dead which the ancient Egyptians had other names for, but which was an ancient text that had spells and prayers and incantations, things that the dead needed in the afterlife. This is a tradition that goes all the way back to the Old Kingdom, writing that we call pyramid text. These were sets of instructions for the afterlife. And then later, we have coffin text, writing on coffins, and then even later in the New Kingdom, we have scrolls like this that we call the Books of the Dead. Sometimes the texts were written on papyrus, like the one we're looking at. Sometimes they were written on shrouds that the dead were buried in. So these were really important texts that were originally just for kings in the Old Kingdom, but came to be used by people who were not just part of the royal family, but still people of high rank. And that's what we're looking at here. This text was found in the tomb of someone named Hunefer, a scribe. A scribe had a priestly status. So we are dealing here with somebody who was literate, who occupied a very high station in Egyptian culture. And we actually see representations of the man who had died, who was buried with this text. And if you look on the left edge of this scroll, at the top, you can see a crouching figure in white, Hunifer, who is speaking to a line of crouching deities, gods, professing the good life that he lived, that he has earned a place in the afterlife. Well, what we have below is a scene of judgment, whether Hunefer has lived a good life and deserves to live into the afterlife. And we see Hunefer, again, this time standing on the far left. And we can recognize him because he's wearing the same white robe. And he's being led by the hand by a god with a jackal head, Anubis, a god that's associated with the dead, with mummification, with cemeteries. And he's carrying in his left hand an ankh a symbol of eternal life, and that's exactly what Hunifer is after. If we continue to move toward the right, we see that jackal-headed god again, Anubis, this time crouching and adjusting a scale. Making sure that it is exactly balanced. On the left side, we see the heart of the dead. So the heart is on one side of the scale, on the other side is a feather. The feather belongs to Ma'at, who we also see at the very top of the scale. And we can see a feather coming out of her head. Now, Ma'at is a deity associated with divine order, with living an ethical, ordered life. And in this case, the feather is lower, the feather is heavier. Hunifer has lived an ethical life and therefore is brought into the afterlife. So he won't be devoured by that evil-looking beast next to Anubis. That's Amit, who has the head of a crocodile, the body of a lion, and the hindquarters of a hippopotamus. He's waiting to devour Hunefer's heart should he be found to have not lived an ethical life, not lived according to Ma'at. The Egyptians believed that only if you lived the ethical life, only if you passed this test, would you be able to have access to the afterlife. It's not like they're creating Christian conception, where you have an afterlife for everybody, no matter if they were blessed or sinful, that is, you either go to heaven or you go to hell. Here, you only go to the afterlife if you have been found to be ethical. The next figure that we see is another deity, this time with the head of an ibis, of a bird. This is Thoth, who is recording the proceedings of what happens to Hunefer, and in this case, recording that he has succeeded and will move on to the afterlife. I love the representation of Thoth. He is so upright, and his arm is stretched out, rendered in such a way that we trust him. He's going to get this right. Next, we see Hunifer yet again, this time being introduced to one of the supreme gods in the Egyptian pantheon, Osiris. And he's being introduced to Osiris by Osiris' son, Horus. Horus is easy to remember because Horus is associated with a falcon and here has a falcon's head. Horus is the son of Osiris and holds in his left hand an ankh, which we saw earlier. And again, that's a symbol of eternal life. He is introducing him 
to Osiris, as you said, who is in this fabulous enclosure, speaks to the importance of this deity. He's enthroned, he carries symbols of Egypt, and he sits behind a lotus blossom, a symbol of eternal life. And on top of that lotus blossom, Horus is four children who represent the four cardinal points, north, south, east, and west. The children of Horus are responsible for caring for the internal organs that would be placed in canopic jars. So they have a critical responsibility for keeping the dead preserved. We see Horus again, but symbolized as an eye. Now remember, Horus is represented as a falcon, as a bird, and so here, even though he's the symbol of the eye, he has talons instead of hands, and those carry an ostrich feather, also a symbol of eternal life. The representation of the eye of Horus has to do with another ancient Egyptian myth, the battle between Horus and Seth, but that's another story. Now behind Osiris, we see two smaller standing female figures, one of whom is Isis, Osiris his wife, the other is her sister Nephthys, who is a guardian of the afterlife and sister of Anubis, the figure who we saw in the very beginning leading Hunifer into judgment. Notice the white platform that those figures are standing on. That represents natron, the natural salts that are deposited in the Nile and that were used by the ancient Egyptians to dry out all of the mummies that are in this room so that they could be preserved. Actually, the word preservation is really key to thinking about Egyptian culture generally because this is a culture whose forms, whose representations in art, remain remarkably the same for thousands of years. Even though there are periods of instability or even just before this, we had the Armarna period where we saw a very different way of representing the human figure. What we see here, these forms look very familiar to us because this is the typical way the ancient Egyptians represented the human figure. Even though this is a painting from the New Kingdom, these forms would have been recognizable to Egyptians thousands of years earlier in the Old Kingdom. And we see that mixture that we see very often in ancient Egyptian art of words, of hieroglyphs, of writing, and images. I love the mix. In our modern culture, we really make a distinction between written language and the visual arts. And here in ancient Egypt, there really is this closer relationship, this greater sense of integration.